Hey, Craig. Hey, Craig. Hey, Craig. Hi, Craig. Craig. Hi, Craig. And hello, everyone. Welcome to the Paddocks. Today, we're going to be doing something a little fun, and that is a little season recap. Now, on the episode, we have Amy, Ido, Casey, Melissa, Leanne, and myself, Chelsea. And we're going to start off with just running through the standings, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Amy. Now... As Chelsea said, we are going to run through the standings, so I highly suggest that you grab a snack, grab a drink. We've got a little bit to go through, so since we are pretty much to the halfway point of the season, we wanted to take a walk through the paddock and take a look back at the season so far. So let's look at the driver's standings so far. So we have Max in P1 with 255 points. We have Sergio Perez in P2 with 156 points. Fernando Alonso is in P3 with 137 points. Lewis Hamilton sits in P4 with 121 points so far. Carlos Sainz, P5, with 83 points. Right behind him is George Russell in P6 with 82 points. Charles Leclerc in P7 with 74 points. Lance Stroll in P8 with 44 points. Lando Norris in P9 with 42 points. Esteban Ocon is in P10 with 31 points. Oscar Piastri, P11 with 17 points. Pierre Gasly, P12 with 16 points. Alex Albon, P13 with 11 points. Nico Hulkenberg is in P14 with 9 points. Valtteri Bottas, P15 with 5 points. Zhou Guan Yu, P16 with 5 points. Yuki Tsunoda is in P17 with 2 points. Kevin Magnussen is in P18 with 2 points. Logan Sargent, P19 with no points so far. Nick DeVries, P20, no points so far. And now, how that translates to the constructor standings, we have Red Bull in first place with 411 points. Right behind them is Mercedes with 203 points. Aston Martin with 181 points. Ferrari with 157 points. McLaren with 59 points. Alpine with 47. Williams with 11 points. Tied with Williams is Haas with 11 points. Alfa Romeo has 9 points. And Alfa Tauri has 2 points so far. That's how everything shakes out midway through the season. And now for some fun facts, I guess, about the season so far. Red Bull, as a team, actually got their 100th win this year uh, after the Canadian Grand Prix that Max won, which is a pretty good accomplishment for the team. And they also, as a team, got their 11th straight win as of Silverstone, which actually ties them for the most consecutive wins with the McLaren team in 1988. So if Max or Checo wins the next race, they will actually be the record holder for the most straight wins in a row. And it's also been, as of the recording today, 584 days since Lewis Hamilton's last win, which is we're coming up on two years. And it's crazy that so many people, including myself, have never seen him win a race since kind of becoming a fan of Formula One. And Max also this year overtook Art and Senna with the number of total wins uh, to have the fifth most wins overall in Formula One uh, with 43. And that means he only has nine more wins to overtake Alan Pross. So who knows if he'll achieve that this year or maybe next year, but we'll see. And he actually has so many points that he's currently leading the Constructors Championship all by himself right now. Like, he doesn't even need Checo, which is crazy. Max is just in a league of his own. I just want to say that, which is really impressive. But some more fun facts. Charles' podium finish at the Austrian GP, which he was in P2, led to the 800th podium for Ferrari. That's pretty big if you ask me. 800 podiums for a team? Come on now. Max really has been a one-man show so far this season. It's a little ridiculous. But in fact, about Austria, the Austrian GP had well over 1,000 individual cases of lap deletions in the 71 laps that that track has. Another fun fact, as the Red Bull girl of the group, Red Bull has five of the fastest pit stops that have happened so far this season, which is just insane and goes to show that, as we've said time and time again, their pit crew is just amazing at what they do, and they deserve the awards that they get. You kind of just can't beat them right now. Now, we just finished up with the Silverstone race, which is a pretty exciting race for anyone who watched. And so we have some additional fun facts about the race itself. 
So it was actually the first time that two British drivers have shared the podium at Silverstone since 1999, uh, when David Coulthard and Eddie Irvine did. So that's the past century. Like, that happened in the 20th century, now we're in the 21st century, so it has been a long time, and I think well overdue. But it was exciting to see, you know, Lando and Lewis up there, enjoying the champagne. And it was also, keeping kind of with the McLaren theme there, Oscar had the highest starting grid position of a rookie since Lance Stroll started second at the 2017 Italian GP. So he's looking like a pretty strong rookie this year, and it was exciting. He almost got a podium. And then another Silverstone kind of fun fact is that it's the first Red Bull win at Silverstone since Mark Webber in 2012. This is Lewis Hamilton's one of his best tracks, so it's been kind of hard for anyone else to have a chance at winning. So even though, you know, Max has been winning a lot this season, it was still kind of cool for him to win this one, kind of for the team, and it's been a while. Now, we want to take some time to look at the struggles that each team and driver has had so far this season. So I'm going to kick it off Red Bull as the Red Bull girl, because I have to. Now, as everybody knows, Red Bull seems to have built an absolute rocket for their car this season, but they have had a few reliability issues, which they're few and far between, so it is refreshing to see as a Red Bull fan, but Echo, with his car, with the pace that it has, he still seems to be struggling a little bit lately. Maybe it's the pressure of Red Bull that's getting to him, or maybe his passion's waning a little bit. We really don't know. No one can be inside his head, though I think it would be interesting to know what his thoughts are. Now, we always have had a Mr. Saturday who's always done well on Quali, but Checo seems to have the opposite issue where he always has performance issues in Quali, which isn't really the greatest place to have those issues. While he makes up for it in the race, he can't really add any benefit to the team because he's normally not close enough to Max to actually help him. So he doesn't get to be that minister of defense that we all know him as. Now, when it comes to Max, I can't really even think of a struggle that Max has had outside of really kind of figuring out how to be a more supportive teammate, shall we say. But for me, I just think that there's no one that's going to ever come close to Danny in terms of being a teammate that Max actually genuinely gets along with and would maybe consider at this point in his life now that he's not a rookie, benefit doing things that would benefit his teammate and not just himself. With Checo, I just don't feel like there's that camaraderie for Max to really want to do anything to help him at this point. I don't know. Um, I just want to say, I feel like Max just says that he's struggling from race to race just to add a little spice because <laughs> he'll say like something's going on but then he'll have like this like 5 10 15 second lead and like we've all mentioned like in the past podcast episodes he's just doing side quests at this point but it's always funny when he's just like something's wrong with the tie or something's wrong with the braking or something and i'm like my dude come on now so maybe that's his only struggle this season I sometimes wonder if that comes through the radio just to screw with other teams. I genuinely can't believe that it's real. The amount of times he'll come on and be like, something's wrong with the tires or something's wrong with the braking or whatever. I'm like, but we see no actual like manifestation of that issue. I'm like, is this legit or are you pulling people's legs here? I mean, honestly, at this point, I have to agree with Amy. It, it feels like a red herring to like throw other people or other teams or other off the scent. But at the same time, maybe he needs to complain in order to do his best work. Could it be like a psychological thing? I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him to play mind games. I think really so far his greatest enemy was the drive shafts in um, Saudi Arabia. That's like the only time he's had a genuine problem with the car this year. And he almost won that race again too, like coming from the back. But I think at this point, he's just kind of bored. So he's just like, what can I do in the car, you know, to make it better? So I think that's part of it. Because he was complaining about the tires and Silverstone. He's like, these are horrible. While he's, you know, 10 seconds ahead of everyone else. But I think, you know, he's just trying to find something to do. Like, honestly, I think if you put, like, a little broadcast of the race on that screen, like, in the car while he's driving, like, it would provide some enrichment, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but it's been an interesting season. <laughs> I mean, we have seen Max watching on the big screen during the race, so like you might as well just give him another screen in the car somehow so he can actually watch. 
He's just on a Sunday drive every freaking weekend. Absolutely bonkers. I do want to say as a non-Red Bull fan, I used to get excited when I would see him say little comments like that. At this point, I just, I think Amy's right. He's just trying to like do like a little like fake me out to the other team. So like the other team strategy team's going to be like, Max is saying this, like keep an eye out. So like at this point, I'm just like, okay, what next? <laughs> Or if you don't want to, like, say, install a second screen in his car to, like, play Netflix or something, what if he became, I don't know, Ferrari's strategist? Because remember in Silverstone, he came on over the radio saying, hey, I just saw Ferrari pit. We're not doing that. We're still sticking to our strategy, correct? And I'm like, dude, if you ran Ferrari's strategy, Ferrari would probably do better i can just imagine him like dri- driving along in the p- front of the grid just casually calling a strategy from the car like if anyone's gonna do it it's basically either max or like fernando alonso like those are really the only two people that i feel like have the i, I don't know audacity shall we say to to do something like that but i don't know it's it's a very max thing to do so enough about Red Bull. Let's go on to one of my favorite teams, Mercedes. So at the showcasing earlier this year, we saw Mercedes bring out their car to show their livery. And what do we see? No side pods. They continue to be the only team, if I'm correct, without side pods and continued that trend for whatever reason. And it showed, well, maybe side pods are the best option, which we'll talk about that later on. Although during testing, it did look promising that the W14 would be fighting alongside the Red Bulls, the Ferraris. Um, We saw something different at the first race of the season. Aston Martin, ahead of the Mercedes, even though Aston Martin has a Mercedes engine too. So there was a lot of questions coming up um, after that first race. As for Lewis and George, they haven't been doing as great as expected. George, after the first few races, even himself said, Red Bull's just going to win every single race. And that just showed like a pessimistic side of George, if you ask me, sadly. But even he had a tough start to the season. He has DNF twice so far, and it hasn't been in his usual top five finishes as we were used to last year. And Lewis, as Casey had mentioned, no wins since Saudi 2021. And that breaks my heart because I would love to see Lewis win since I'm still really fresh into the sport. So who knows? Maybe things will change as the season goes on. I wish that we had watched the Mercedes car reveal live together because if you guys could have seen my face when that car showed up with no side pods, I was just sitting there with my head in my hands laughing because I was so confused as to why they thought that that was going to work for them when it definitely didn't work last year. I was so confused when I saw that car, but I'm not an engineer, so I could have been wrong. Maybe there's possibility that it could have worked, but I really want to see like Mr. Consistency back from George. He's just not, he's not been Mr. Consistency and we kind of miss it. I mean, well, I think Mercedes is with a cost cap in place. They're used to just being able to throw like hundreds of millions of dollars and trying like all these different kind of concepts out all at once. And now they're kind of realizing, oh, we're stuck with this. And they're very stubborn. And I think they have a lot of pride. And so that's why it took them a while to like, you know, be like, okay, maybe this isn't working. Like, remember the open letter, I think, that Toto wrote at the beginning of the season being like, we're so sorry. Like, you know, our failure as a team. And it's like, dude, it's the second like race of the season. You know, things can change here. (laughs) But let's just say, uh, I don't think anyone was too surprised when they showed up with the spied pods at some point, because it obviously was not working, but I mean, they've, they've caught up pretty well. So I think the fight between, you know, the Mercedes, the Ferrari, the Aston Martin, I think it's a pretty solid fight this year. That open letter, honestly, it just made me laugh because yes, we had what, eight years of Mercedes dominance pre 2022, really? Because I mean, they were still dominating in 2021, except at the last second, Max ran away with it, but still, it feels funny. But the open letter, I mean, it made me chuckle when it came out. And it goes to show that 
Mercedes is so used to winning. Mercedes fans are so used to winning pre-2022. Because I'm even though um, Lewis didn't win 2021, they still won the constructor. So as a team, they were still a solid team. And I feel like a letter like that indicates almost like a fallen hero when losing to most other teams is normal. It's par for the course. And I feel like they're still kind of grappling with that reality, even though more recently in the season, their upgrades seem to have been working. I mean, we've seen Lewis on the podium a few times. George has been up there, what, like once? So they're getting there. They're just not at Red Bull's level. And I feel like no one expects them to be at Red Bull's level except for themselves. I do want to say I love the black livery of the Mercedes. There's just something about that car being in all black with the neon yellow that Lewis has and then that like peelish blue, whatever you decide, that color that represents George. It's just chef's kiss. And as Matt from P1 with Matt and Tommy said, that car is sexy. That's all. I could bet y'all money that Christian Horner would never in a million years allow an open letter like that to be published from Red Bull. It is just, it's not their brand. It's not his brand. That is very much so a Toto feeling decision. But, you know, I, I have to agree with you. I think Mercedes is so used to constantly winning that they don't know what to do when they're not on the top. And I'm someone that I believe that losing makes you better. And so, I don't know. I'm excited to see what they do moving forward. And then I think, if I remember correctly, Toto kind of joined Mercedes right when the dominance began. So he's never really experienced a team that's lost. So... I mean, because Christian Horner's been with Red Bull since the beginning of time. So he's been through the ups and downs. But Toto's never really lost before. So this is kind of the first couple years where we're seeing how, how he handles a team that's not just destroying everyone else. Even though he would say, oh, you know, it was a hard fight, you know, some good competition. I mean, like if anyone watched the race, you know, Lewis and Valtteri were kind of running away with it. But uh, it's the first kind of couple years where they actually have to really fight the other teams to kind of get up there in the points and to even have a challenge at winning. Yeah, and I feel like it truly goes to show also with, especially I would say, Lewis, because he's been used to always being in a dominant-ish car. I mean, it started out with McLaren. He won his first world championship in his second season. That's like unheard of. And then he moved on to Mercedes after Shocker and Rosberg basically did all the grunt work and built up that car. And then he just was able to run. And now it's like, that doesn't happen anymore. And I feel like that is what made George better last season. Because George coming from Williams knows a not so great car he knows how to drive a worse car so he is more careful can tow the line etc but oh well we'll see what the rest of the season brings and with that in mind let's move on to aston martin because they had their own struggles now well aston martin is a customer car of mercedes and did in preseason testing mercedes They've had an interesting start to their season. So Lance has had two finishes outside of the top 10 and two DNFs. He's kind of just been, in my opinion, cruising along, which is really nice. He has been quite consistent, but he hasn't really been giving anybody a major, major fight so far. I want to see him a little bit more daring. I can't really say if any of this is caused by strategy or if it's the car, but I just want to see a little bit more drive and grit out of him. Like I, I, I'm wanting like some kind of a bold move out of him, just a little something more. Now with Fernando, I kind of don't really know what to say about him with his season. He's been just so damn consistent. He's finishing the points consistently. Now I kind of 
want a little bit more of like that spicy, a little cocky Fernando that we've had in the past and just really see him bring the fight back because it just kind of, you know, it feels like their competitiveness is waning a smidge on my end, but I'm excited to see what upgrades they can bring to this car and see what happens with the rest of their season because they have been pretty consistent. I do miss that spicy, cocky, out-of-pocket Fernando, but I really do believe he jinxed himself in saying that there'll be no more podium less or no more finishes without Aston Martin not on the podium. And when he said that and watching Silverstone last weekend, I was just like, yep, he jinxed himself and the team. And it sucks because they were doing really well at the beginning. Yeah, he definitely managed to like jinx himself a little bit i don't know maybe this week off between silverstone and hungary maybe he's gonna go do some kind of like a cleanse or something i don't know go jump in a body of water wash that shit off like come back refreshed but we'll see i mean to be fair i do think the car does tend to be a bit more circuit dependent than some of the other cars in the grid so i think silverstone was not their best circuit which kind of sucks because it was one of the it was like their home race in a way but there are other circuits they just do better on because, I mean, in Spain, they didn't do too well. But obviously, in a lot of other circuits, you know, Fernando's been on the podium. So I think it's really circuit dependent. And I know Fernando's, like, typically been pretty good at Hungary. So that'll be interesting to see if the car is good in Hungary. And then the strategy, like, they've been good with, like, kind of petitioning the FIA. Because they've won that twice. But sometimes the strategy in the race is a little questionable. Um, at least in qualifying. I know that's a lot, the several times the lance hasn't quite made it up as high as fernando is they kind of screwed him over with like the tire strategy and qualifying or he got blocked by someone which it just sucks for anyone and the i think it was austria or no yeah i think it was austria where they both pitted them really really late under the virtual safety car and lance kind of got cut off or something where the green light started again green flag started again and he was like just exiting so they just kind of got screwed over that way so i mean every i mean not quite ferrari level strategy screw ups but not where you'd kind of i guess want one of the top teams to be at strategy wise c is totally right it does seem like a lot of their issues tend to hit them mainly in quali which is a little weird but again, it's the one place where I'm like, okay, if you have some of your issues in quali, not ideal. I'd rather you have them in practice, but quali's not going to completely bite you in the butt, especially if you've, your car has pace. But I kind of feel like Aston has been favoring or backing, I will guess I'll say, Fernando a lot more than Lance, which is, for some people, is probably a little weird because Lance's dad owns the team. But... Fernando's also the one who's already got titles under his belt, got the experience. He's just always going to be a little bit more consistent. But I don't know. I would love to see them really give Lance a fighting chance at some real points. I mean, Aston has been a beast, but they have, have had their struggles. And another team that has been on the struggle bus is my dear Ferrari. And honestly, as a Ferrari fan, I shouldn't be too surprised that the team as a whole is, once again, on it. Especially with their car not being able to really compete with the likes of Mercedes and Aston Martin. And I'm not even going to mention Red Bull because, as we've discussed, they're in a class of their own. And yet, when they presented their car at Maranello back in February, I and I'm sure many others were optimistic. I mean, yes, delivery reveals are a marketing tool, first and foremost, for the teams. And we all know that the Tifosi are suckers for all things Ferrari, year in, year out, no matter how bad the car is. But at the same time, they showed the car on track at the reveal, so you'd think that they had a stable and reliable car, otherwise they wouldn't do that so as to not draw attention to their struggle. But oh boy, was I wrong. Then when the season started off with a litany of DNFs for Charles, it was just like, what's wrong? Like, how? But thankfully, the days of the DNFs seem to be a thing of the past, or 
maybe I hope I didn't just jinx it by saying that. But at this time, the upgrades seem to be working in their favor. Charles has been on the podium twice so far, and Carlos usually misses it by only a hair. So at least from a car perspective, we're on an upswing, I guess. But now strategy, don't get me started. It is as bad as ever. The only true glimmers of success seemingly come when Carlos or Charles go against what the strategists tell them to do, such as in Canada. And at this point, it seems the only way forward. Unless something very drastic happens with the people on the pit wall, who remember are mostly still relics from the era of Mattia Bonato. Same with the car, to be honest, and that is why I'm still hopeful, as the new team principal, Fred Vasseur, had nothing to do with this car's pre-upgrade, really, as most of the development was done pre-him joining the team in January of this year. And since we're seeing some improvements on the car, I'm hopeful for the rest of the season, because at the end of the day, I'm still the same delusional Ferrari fan I've always been. But yeah, rest of the season, cautiously optimistic, maybe? I don't know what anyone else thinks. So everybody knows I want to be a Ferrari fan. Like I am the Italian girl who really, really, really wants to be a Ferrari girl, but I just can't do it because they're just not consistent enough. It really hurts, but I have to give them credit. The fact that they did a shakedown, their reveal just made my heart so happy. I really wish that more teams did that with their livery reveal. I want to see that car move. Like seeing a livery just like standing still on a stage doesn't do it for me. I need to see this thing live and in action. But I really hoping that Fred Vesser at some point decides that he needs to clean house and throw that strategy team on its damn head because the guys have the abilities. They've got the talent. The strategy is just severely lacking. And the fact that they have done better when Carlos and Charles have been their own strategists is a little concerning, if you ask. I really enjoyed that reveal. Like you mentioned, Amy, the whole like seeing the car drive around and just hearing Charles and Carlos hyped about the speed and how great that car was where like Charles was like, can I just do one more lap? And Carlos was like, no, 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 come on in. Like, it's my turn now. It brought kind of like a high to myself where it's like yes let's go this season's gonna be good but alas here we are that's it <laughs> yeah and i mean it's not even just the strategy it's just kind of like the pit wall isn't really doing their job because several times this year they just haven't let their drivers know about the traffic on the track which is one of their main jobs to because you know if you impede you get a penalty and that's happened several times and it's also a safety issue too like the other drivers kind of need to know where the other cars are and how fast they are going so they don't hit them and there's not an accident. So it seems really weird that it's been like a continuous problem at a top team that they're just not doing the bare minimum of kind of letting their drivers know kind of what's going on. And it's just been really kind of, I don't know, in inconsistent in a way. Like it's crazy to me that Carlos right now is ahead of Charles in the championship standings, but... Charles is the one that has two podiums, a pole position. So it's just, it's kind of just weird. And I can see potentially, like, you know, as time goes on, the possibility of kind of infighting between the two, because, you know, Charles is ahead right now, or Carlos is ahead right now, but I think the team kind of sees Charles as the number one driver. So I can see some potential tension coming up if, you know, it gets any closer than it is. Meanwhile, we could talk about Ferrari and their questionable strategies. Uh, let's go on to uh, McLaren. So we started the season off looking like a tractor, struggling to stay on pace. And it was not the, if you ask me, not the prettiest thing to witness. It hurt to see Lando and Oscar so behind the midfield. I was hoping they would be, you know, given their his the team history and knowing how great of a driver Lando is and how great of a driver Oscar is as well too based on like the other series and everything I was just like you probably have a chance finally but alas here we are yeah 
That's what I can say about that. Um, but at some of the races here and there, we did at least see Oscar and Lando finishing the points, making Oscar the best performing rookie so far this season. And I will die on this hill until the end of November, beginning of December, whenever the season ends. I don't know when the season ends. Honestly, it's just so many races. <laughs> I think he will be winning rookie of the year. So I, if I'm wrong, I don't know what I'll do. But... With everything going on at the beginning of the season, a lot of people began to speculate that Danny Rick had a curse upon them with the way their contract, their relation had ended. And I, again, I'm a believer of stuff like that. So it was kind of funny to me, but at the same time, I'm like, mm, Danny, what did you do? Oh, I think Danny 100% cursed him for that first race because, like, that was just, it couldn't have gone any worse because Oscar basically got the blue screen of death on his steering wheel. Like, I don't think I've ever heard about that happening in a Formula One race. And so he couldn't even finish his first Formula One race. And then Lando just had to kind of keep limping back into the pits like six or seven times. It was, it was ridiculous. Like, I don't know why they didn't just retire the car, but he kept going, you know, 30 pit stops later, you know, the car did cross the finish line, but luckily that was kind of like they hit the rock bottom real early So, like, it's been upward trajectory since, but, like, that was just an awful way to start the season. As the witchy one of the group, he absolutely put a curse on them for, at minimum, the first race of the season. Because there is no reason that a Formula One car should get the blue screen of death. It is not a PC. If it is, there's a problem. The fact that I do remember that Lando had to go back to the pits seven times throughout the race. Fill up on basically air for the car. That thing was hanging on by a thread, and there is no shot of a doubt in my brain that that was absolutely the work of some badass witch. But I mean, it seems like the curse has been lifted, so who knows? I know Danny forgave them or said he's cool with whatever happened. So I mean, it's Danny. We all love him for it. He's got a heart of gold. But McLaren really gave us a tractor for the beginning of the season, and it was really, even as a not a McLaren fan, it was rough to watch. If anything, he might have actually transferred the curse to another team for his Alpine, because they haven't had it uh, quite so good either. They also had a pretty rough start to the season with Pierre, his first time with a new team, a non-Red Bull team, and he can't even make it out of Q1. And then during the race... Esteban's fight with the FAA begins and he, you know, I think he got like 30 seconds of penalties. Like they retired the car, but it was insane. And both Alpines ended up taking each other out in Australia after the chaotic restart. And it didn't get much better in Baku because Pierre's car caught on fire. And so it seems like they have like really, they have a couple of good weekends kind of mixed in between the two and some average performances, but it seems like they've had some pretty disastrous weekends as well. You know, Esteban, In his fight with the penalties, I think he actually broke the record for the most penalties in one race in Austria with five. I think he had almost had about 40 seconds of penalties kind of at the conclusion of all of that was just just insane. And that he wasn't dead last with all of those penalties was crazy. But another double DNF in Silverstone and actually being overtaken by McLaren in the, the Constructors Championship, it seems like... It's not looking good for Alpine this year. It was actually pretty hilarious in the post-race kind of interview with Oscar. They mentioned to him that McLaren had overtaken Alpine. And as the Piasco and, you know, as a former Alpine test driver, it was pretty funny that they mentioned that to him. And the fact that, you know, Alonso's lurking in the background, you know, smiling like a maniac because he also has beef with Alpine. But hopefully we can kind of see them keep it together. Uh, for the remainder of the season and consistency, I guess, is key. So we shall see if they can kind of get that for the rest of the season. My favorite thing about that interview with Oscar is the smirk that kid had on his face. It's just next level. I Yeah, Alpine's just had some kind of a rain cloud following them. I don't know who the heck they pissed off, but something's just not right. So I'm hoping that they get some good upgrades and can be a bit more competitive. Yeah, let's hope for Alpine, but a team that, I want to say, had a very rough car to drive, Williams, has been doing pretty well, considering everything. 
especially since the upgrades since canada alex has been driving the shit out of that car like getting i think it was eight points in canada and then via a drs train basically and keeping the same tires on for almost the entire race and then even like in silverstone in austria he's just been so consistent And if he didn't manage to be in the points, he came very close to the points. And he's been basically carrying Williams on his back, honestly. Because while I do like Logan, he still has zero points this season. And yes, he's more recently, since the upgrades, gotten closer to scoring points, like finishing 15, 13, up from his usual like 18th, 19th, 20th, still zero points. And yes, he's a rookie and all that, but if your teammate outscores you, you gotta question yourself. And we don't want that to happen to Logan. While I don't think it will, because William a- Williams is not AlphaTauri, Logan, you need to do something, boy. Please. Because, yes, the car's a tractor, but you've known this before joining the team. It has been a tractor for a few years. Do something, please. So, from one struggle car to another, Haas. I can't say they've been having the best season so far, but it's definitely at least off to a better start compared to the last seasons. Nico has only had one DNF so far. However, for Kevin, he did have one DNF. And he did not complete two races. There's a difference between the two. But at least they've been putting up a fight, although with the new regulations and the close, already close midfield fight, it hasn't been the easiest. And I know when I'm watching qualities or something happens and I see the Haas, I'm always just like, it had to be a Haas. Like, it, it, at this point, it's just like, I don't expect anything more or less from them. Just wishing they were better because they represent the United States as a team. I'm speaking of midfield teams. Another one that is honestly the definition of mid this season is uh, Alfa Romeo. They've just kind of been there. They've had some, you know, points finishes here and there. They're still kind of towards the bottom of the constructors. Haven't really had any horrible moments, but haven't had any like great moments either. They've had, you know, reliability issues, which honestly might be connected to the Ferrari power unit because that's also Haas's supplier for a power unit. But they're just kind of chilling at the back. I mean, it seems like a really laid back team and, you know, all that. But yeah, they're just kind of there. It feels like almost because in 2026, they're going to be Audi. It almost feels like at this point, they just checked out. Like Alfa Romeo is like, whatever. This is our last year as Alfa Romeo Sauber. We're done. Now, if we're going to talk about the struggle bus, guys, we have to talk about the team that is honestly driving the damn bus at this point, and that is Alpha Tauri. There's really, there's not much we can say. They just, just don't have it. They don't have the pace. Drivers don't have it. I mean, Yuki's got two points, but he's still having braking issues, issues with just his, his, Lack of maturity as a driver, I guess, is the best way to say it. And I think also some questionable strategy. And Nick just really hasn't gelled with that car to save his life. But it is what it is. This is their last season as Alpha Tauri. So I kind of also, in a similar situation as Alpha Romeo, kind of feels like the season is just a wash for them. But we'll see what they rebrand as and see if they come back a little bit stronger. Now... As we've seen, Alpha Tower is just kind of struggling. But I think that the drivers have done a really great job of keeping their heads up and just kind of moving along as best they can. It has come out that Danny is actually going to be moving to Alpha Tower, which is fantastic. I mean, while I don't love the way the situation was handled, I love that I get my honey badger back. But the situation was not handled well, in my opinion. But that's just me. 
I am sensing some upgrades for them, and I'm really hoping that with Danny and Yuki as a pair, that they can get that car on the points a little bit more. I'd love to see them bring some upgrades that bring them some more pace. But I think with this potential new rebrand coming, I think next year could potentially be a much stronger year for them. Um, I'm excited to see what they rebrand as and just see what they bring in terms of car concept for next year. Especially on the topic of car concept, they, they as in Helmut Marco, have admitted that they're going to be as close in terms of car concept as possible to their sister team, Red Bull. As long as, obviously, there's no regulation breaches. But they're like, this whole individual car concept thing is not really working as this season shows. So we're going to try to kind of copy what RB does as much as we can. Which, I mean, I think is a good way forward. Especially considering how well Red Bull is doing this season. I think that's a fantastic idea. I don't kind of understand why they haven't done the whole share the knowledge concept as being sister teams, but it is what it is. I think that we're going to keep seeing a lot more nomination from Red Bull. I know, I know, everybody's sick of it, but I really think we're going to get it. Max is just in a class of his own. It's master class city for that kid. And I mean, I still think we're going to get some competition from other teams, but it just kind of feels like Max is going to run away with the title again. Will we see Checo come back and be his minister of defense self? I don't really know. I'm hopeful because I really want to see Max have a teammate who actually can maybe bring the fight to him. But only time's going to tell for that one. Honestly, I've kind of been having a blast uh, watching Red Bull this season. I, I can say I have been converted. Uh, I have joined the the Red Bull camp, but it's just kind of fun. In a way, because, I mean, like I said, I wasn't really a fan during the Mercedes domination. But even though they are dominating, it's not like the rest of the field is boring. Like, that's where the action is. So, like, yeah, you know, Max is having his little drive at the front. But, like, the rest of the team, they're, like, battling for their lives. Like, you know, people, and I think it was, like, Nick and K-Mag were, like, battling it out for, like, P18. You know, life or death scenario there. They're, they're going at it. So it's just been an interesting season to watch even though there, there, I guess, has been a domination. But it'll be interesting to kind of see how Checo goes um, for the rest of the season, especially with the switch at Alphatari. But who knows how many more records will we'll break this year. Uh, we have a couple more months, half the season to go, a lot of races. So a lot of records that can still be broken. Well, records can be broken. Max can dominate this year. I'm hoping for Mercedes to at least put up fight as a team and as drivers they brought in those damn side pods finally by the monaco gp and it so far has been looking pretty promising we've seen lewis on the podium end up in p3 p2 so maybe this is my tifosi side coming in with being delusional i'm hopeful that lewis will finally get a win two years later so let's manifest it and put it in the air i can hope if it doesn't happen, there's always next year. It's okay. Now, if we're going to be a little delusional, Alpine, I would love to potentially see a Pierre Gasly podium again. I know that's probably pretty unlikely, but we did get Esty Bestie on the podium. So while I really do want to see more of Esty on the podium, I also really would love to see Pierre at least get a single podium. Like, dude really has some talent, but... He's just had some consistency problems, some issues with the car. But my delusional self is going to say that we are going to get a Pierre Gasly podium with Alpine. Is that actually possible? We're going to find the hell out. I mean, who wouldn't love a Pierre Gasly podium? Because remember Monza 2020 when he won that race? And I just remember seeing the pictures after the podium was done and everything. Him just sitting there, crying his eyes out. And I'm like, oh my god, I need to see this again. I guess talking about a kind of out-of-pocket podiums, I think it'd be really fun to see either Alex and the Williams on the podium, like at Monza, because the Williams typically does really well at Monza. I think because the car has been doing really well and Alex has been driving the wheels off of that thing, 
I think if he was able to snatch like a P3, that would just kind of be the icing on the on the cake for him this year. And then I think it'd be fun to see Oscar on the podium. You know, Ricky up there, he almost got it in Silverstone. So I think, you know, if, if McLaren is up there, perhaps they can get a double podium. That would be interesting. And who knows? Eventually, Red Bill will break down and someone else will have to win. So it'll be interesting to kind of see who that might be you know is it lando is he gonna get his first win or is fernando finally gonna get the 33rd like there are a lot of possibilities for for who could take that win from max now seeing as we've talked about some of the rookies i don't know why but i really want to see logan Sargent get some points at coda i i really 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 hope that that kid gets some points on u.s soil because that crowd a is gonna lose their damn minds and I think he's going to lose his mind if he could pull off just points. I'm not even saying podium, just points. I'll take a P8. I'll, that's fine with me. But I feel like that really needs to happen. I would love to see but him and Oscar both manage to get some points this season. But who knows? Now, while I would love to talk about the rookies and everything they've done so far, that'll be a future episode. Trust. Um, I'm hoping for Ferrari to make a comeback. Meanwhile, they are points ahead of McLaren in the Constructors' Championship. I'm hoping to see still a bit of the spicy side from Spicy Man Carlos, but also Charles standing up for themselves with the strategy team and being like, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to do this instead. And meanwhile, maybe wins are not on the horizon as it is for Mercedes, maybe not. You know, some podium finishes would be nice, like here and there, and not so much mess ups where my anxiety and my stress is not so elevated. A girl can help again. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about Alpha Romeo already being mid, and therefore their highlights have really been off the track, not on it. And such as Joe's fashion statements that are going, dare I say, after Sir Lewis Hamilton's crown. And then we have Valtteri Bottas' helmet that his girlfriend helps design. And I just, A, I love the fact that she helps him, but also the designs that she comes up with. Oh my god. We have to give Tiffany credit where credit is due. She's so talented at what she does. But we also have, have to give Valtteri credit. The mullet. The mullet is really just a shining beacon on the Formula One grid right now, and I absolutely love it. Now, we've talked about Aston Martin a little bit. I really want to see Lance get a podium. I don't just want him in the points. I want a Lance podium, for the love of God, please. Like I just, I need it. I need it. It's been so long since we've seen Lance on a podium, and I just, my heart needs it. And I'm really praying to the Formula One gods here that we get it and we get it soon. Yeah, I'm hoping that Aston Martin kind of, you know, gets it together again for for both of their drivers. I think a double podium would be insane as they seem to get along really well. So I think it would be interesting to see kind of how that goes. And I really hope that like Fernando or Lewis can potentially take that P2 and the constructors away from Checo. Because right now, they're driving really well in cars that, you know, are pretty good, but they're not Red Bulls. So I think the fight's really on for P2 right now. And would love to see, you know, some more uh, Max podcast guests. You know, we love the consistency, you know, return guests. But it'd be nice to see some new faces for the rest of the season. You know, mix it up a little bit, but... Yeah, I think anytime like a team has like a double podium where both uh, of the team members are up there, like it's just so much fun. And I think Aston deserves that for the jump they've made this year with their car and everything. They deserve their double podium and it's coming. And, you know, a one, two is like the dream. Very unlikely, but we can hope. So for people who have listened to our Austria recap, we kind of threw out that the track really needs to get some gravel traps, some grass, something in turns 9 and 10. Well, it has been confirmed that they're going to be adding gravel traps to turn 9 and 10. Um, since the Red Bull Ring also hosts MotoGP races, 
it was what caused the organizers to not make the change before the race. But I wanted gravel, but it needed to be signed off by MotoGP. So next year when we're back at Austria, there will be a gravel trap for turns nine and turn 10. So we'll see. So now for a pre-outro to this fun episode about our team struggles and their highs. Here's a moment of the first half of the season. A little update on Imola and our favorite F1 cat, Formulino. While I did some digging around um, about the track itself, I couldn't really find anything. So I can only imagine they're still cleaning up being done around the track itself and the surrounding towns and cities. And of course, obviously, relief is needed. So wherever you are, if you have the heart to do it, you can always donate to those relief programs. However, I have some very exciting news about Formulino. You remember that the track social media posted a picture of him safe and sound in shelter. And now it looks like he has a brother. Or as Formulino likes to say, a servant to the king himself. So let me introduce you to the Duke of Autodromo Imola, Brando. He's a Frenchie who, as he said on his IG page, at Duke.Brando, he adores motoring, snacks, and taking naps next to the office on the track. So who knows, maybe next season we'll see some Brando and Roscoe content. I would love that. So, you know, let's just hope for the best next year and get excited for that. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I cannot believe summer break is almost here. And you know what that means? Silly season is creeping up on the grid. Well, actually, it kind of already happened a little bit, but uh, we'll get into that at another time. Don't worry, we will still have a Silly Season episode during the summer break. We have to leave you wanting more, you know? What are you expecting from this Silly Season? Ferrari changes? You know what, same babes. But let us know your thoughts. Reach out to our socials everywhere we are at Paddock Girls Podcast, except on Twitter. There you can find us at Paddock Girls Pod. Thanks for joining us in the paddock. See you next time. Bye, Craigers. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig.